What is up, YouTube? This video is part two of a two-part series documenting my DIY install of my insulated subfloor and my 2020 Ford Transit campervan conversion. All these clips you're seeing are from part one, where I show basically my aluminum substructure, the rigid foam insulation, and of course the templating. In part two, I'm gonna show you the prep, the water sealing, the cut, and then final install of the plywood subfloor. This is a doozy of a project, so get yourself a drink and spend a few minutes hanging out with me. My name's Eric Johnson, and welcome to my channel. In 2021, I bought a Ford Transit cargo van so I could convert it into the off-grid home of my dreams. I'll be documenting and sharing everything about this DIY van conversion. If you'd like to follow along, by all means, hit that subscribe button. After completing your prerequisite truffle shuffle, we're now applying a mold resistant primer to the wood. This is just to kind of help water seal. Also, if you get the chance, uh, definitely steal your dad's evil scientist lab coat when you're painting, because it makes painting way more fun. Just kidding, painting still sucks. But uh, we want to make sure to go ahead and lay down a really thick coat here. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to come back and do a second coat, so I'm just laying it on super thick. And then when it dries, flipping it over, doing both sides, and especially paying attention to seal the edges, if you can, try and um, do painting last. If you do end up coming back and cutting something, you're going to have to then reseal that seam. But here I had a kind of change of plan and decided to actually cut my overall floor length two inches shorter. So it's not the end of the world. Like I said, you just need to make sure to come back and reseal the seams. But once you have all your sheets painted, you're ready to move to the next step. The way that I aligned all these sheets relative to the van was pulling this center line mark. And I tried initially using a laser level, but it proved to be just about impossible with how much the van was moving. And in the end, a old fashioned chalk line was the best way to do this. And once I double checked that everything was in fact centered, we're kind of ready for the next step, which is marking where all of the aluminum joists exist underneath the plywood floor. I really wanted to make sure that my floor was extremely rigid and did not move and risk the chance of squeaking. So I opted to use a combination of hardware as well as an adhesive. So what I'm doing here is I went ahead and I tacked in two screws just in two different locations to prevent the board from moving while I went and then marked all of the remaining screw point locations. It's technically three steps, it starts off with uh, counter sinking where every single screw head is going to be and then boring out the wood so that the screw does not engage the wood. And then the third step is coming back in with an even smaller drill bit and then finally uh, drilling a hole through the aluminum. And though it was a lot of steps and a lot of work, uh, even after something like 140 or 50 screws, I didn't have a single issue with either uh, tearing or stripping out um, or any of the screws breaking. So in the end, I'd say it worked perfectly and I would totally recommend it. Now, this seam is basically the one and only seam that might actually um, show up in our floor plan, like the walkway, the main walkway. And so I do pay quite a bit of special attention. And you'll notice that I uh, not only drilled all the holes, but also the screws at that seam all go in at an angle here. Uh, whereas everywhere else, I'm just going straight up and down. And that's to try and help pull those two sheets of plywood together again to kind of minimize that seam. So after getting the two center panels installed and cleaning everything up, I'm moving on to cutting the side strips to their final length. We initially cut them down to one foot wide sections and here I'm cutting them to the final, I think it was 10 and a quarter of an inch, somewhere around there um, on each side. And then the front section is the full eight foot long uh, plywood sheet. You know, we don't cut it down as far as its length 
but then the back section we did cut to length and then here you can see all I'm doing is going through and basically finding all of the bumps and protrusions on the sides and transferring those marks directly to our side strip so this is kind of like a templating process but you know instead of getting a second piece and, and kind of doubling up all the work we stick to using just our one and only wheel well template because it does have those radius curves and then transferring that directly to the two pieces lined up here simultaneously and this made for an extremely accurate fit and then the rest of this is just kind of marking and cutting out all those various nooks and crannies the last piece of advice that I would give is if my initial markings, if I had just used like a speed square like I'm using here, probably would have been a bit more accurate and the final cuts would have been a little tighter fitting. I guess I might as well take a moment to just say, I don't know if it's dawned on any of you guys just how often we've used a friggin' jigsaw in all of our projects up to this date, but I think it's almost been every single one. So if you're gonna do this, you know, getting yourself a nice jigsaw just might be worth it because you're gonna use it a ton. Now, I guess this cuts a pretty good uh, demonstration of not trying to always favor your dominant hand. I'm right-handed, but often it really is just about whatever hand has the best angle relative to making like the curve or the turn and relative to your body. So, you know, whatever feels best to you. So now that I've got the kind of um, perimeter trim pieces cut, I'm going and putting down that same primer coat. And while that was drying, I decided it was a good time to go ahead and do the glue up for the two main center panels. This first panel is the full four by eight sheet. So kind of the biggest section. And I wanted to make sure that this guy in particular was right up front where the vast majority of your kind of living area, at least in my design is gonna be. The rear of the van is gonna be my bed. Obviously with the flares, it's gonna be sideways. I'm gonna have a permanent bed. It's not gonna be like a desk or a convertible or whatever the heck. Um, and so just knowing that the bed was gonna be taking up a permanent fixed space, that meant that pretty much all of my living area is gonna be up front of the bed. And so it almost entirely falls on this one panel. All of the seams being at the edge or perimeter of the van makes it so that they're pretty much all going to be covered by some sort of cabinetry or like I said, be under the bed itself. The one seam that really does exist that I might be able to step on is this seam right here. And so I paid real close attention to that seam in particular. And it's the only seam that I glued kind of at an angle or drilled and screwed at an angle because I wanted to have the two boards pinch each other. So I did that seam first and then would drill and screw the rest of the, the I guess you'd say like in body screws for these panels. So here I actually cut the uh, template a little too tight. <laughs> and so it was causing a bit of a wedge. Um, and so I had to go back and trim it ever so slightly. And then uh, once we trimmed it, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go back and paint, you know, repaint. I decided that I didn't have time because <laughs> I wanted to be done with this project because, oh my goodness, it took forever. Um, and this was, this was actually a Christmas Eve day that I'm doing all of this and I just yeah wanted to go home for Christmas. So anyways, decided not to, to um, reseal those trimmed pieces. So you can see right here, the edge of this one guy uh, doesn't have the paint um, or I guess this one side, but I figured it's not the end of the world. I did my best. Um, 
I'm just trying to make sure that we set these in as gently as possible without getting glue absolutely everywhere. And I did change things up on the perimeter. Instead of doing all three of the drillings at once, I actually only did the countersink drilling. And then I figured rather than risking um, misaligning like, you know, 16 screw points, I would just go ahead and do the final screw uh, step and the final drill step after putting on the glue. I don't know which way was any better. They both seem to work just fine. Maybe I would favor the second step just because it was, I think, I think a little faster just because I, I had less time spent fiddling with, with getting the fit right after, you know, laying down the pieces. So anyways. Thank you guys so much for sticking around until the end. If you're still here, you're still sticking it out, let me know. Give this video a like. It is one of the best ways that I can tell if you guys are appreciating the content. And if you guys have stuck it out this long, this is like, you are exactly who I made this video for. And so just, you know, I wanna say first and foremost, really, I do appreciate you guys. For some reason, I thought I would see steam. <laughs> just because, so cold. Um, oh, my poor little noggin. Man, that makes such a big difference. Holy Moses. Let's get into kind of the, I guess, overall summary of my insulated subfloor, which was really kind of like two projects. You know, part one, the first half of this project was just the aluminum substructure and then the insulation, kind of the cut, the fitment and then the glue up of those components. I'm not really gonna get too much into the overall financial budget of everything, cause I already went into that somewhat on the first video. I'll just do like a quick little uh, summary right here. If you're interested, go ahead and take like a screenshot. But uh, beyond the budget of this particular project, which actually was pretty inexpensive, getting into sort of the hurdles and the struggles and maybe some things that I would have done differently. First and foremost, as I mentioned in the last video, the rigid foam sheet that I used was polystyrene by mistake. I seriously thought I had poly iso. I've been saying poly iso and I don't know how many, you know, like my insulation video and all throughout that other video. If I had known that I was buying polystyrene, absolutely I would have bought poly, poly iso. And so polystyrene's not the end of the world. It is still mold and pest resistant, which is pretty good, but it does have a lower IS or a, a lower R value per inch. So it's not as insulating as poly ISO. And that is one of the things that I'm like, mm, it's a bit of a bummer. But as far as the thickness, this is kind of like the main thing that now that I've done it and, and also looking at that resulting R value, one inch polystyrene, it's only gonna get you like a three point, I think it's like 3.9, I'll put the actual number here. And so if I was to do this differently, I would actually, instead of using a one inch rigid foam board and then one inch, you know, aluminum tubes, I would have gone up to a one and a half inch. That half of an inch difference at my height of 5'10", I think would have been pretty trivial. That Ford Transit being as tall as it is, it's, it's way taller than I am. I already have more than six inches or so of, of 
I mean, it's like five-ish inches of clearance. Now, sure, I haven't done my ceiling insulation in the drop-down, but I'm not really gonna be, you know, going crazy there. Well, maybe, maybe now I'll be doing a bit more. I could have spared the half inch and not really noticed it, yet I'm <laughs> certain that every time I get out of bed and put my feet on the floor, you know, it's it, that kind of uh, persistent feeling of cold floors is something I think I will notice and is probably gonna bug me. So a little bit of a bummer. There are things you can do about it, like adding a rug. For those of you that are still in the planning stages, and if you're not like in that six foot two, you know, height category, where you're really, really concerned about your headspace, um, then I would strongly suggest you also consider going with something a bit thicker than that one inch. I didn't really give it enough thought in the design phase. And that's, like I said, kind of really the only real regret that I have. As far as I guess like another kind of design philosophy, no one's really brought it up yet, but I, I guess kind of like a preemptively addressing it. I very intentionally left all of the gaps in the corrugations open. I already own um, mini cell foam that I purchased to fill the corrugations initially. So I was like, I'd already researched it, had already purchased it, already paid that money and decided against using it because all of my research has led me to believe that moisture is guaranteed. So no matter what you do, there is no avoiding it. You are going to have moisture occurring within the van and managing that moisture. I didn't want to close off all those air channels and kind of create like stagnant areas where air couldn't flow and water could then build up and create rust or, or mold issues. So in the spirit of George at Humble Road, leaving those air channels open was very much an intentional choice. I guess like the next major section in, in reviewing the project was the templating. I feel like the one template that I made, basically just for the wheel wells, those are the only real complex contours that you have to manage. Thankfully, the Ford Transits are really square. I think basically running the length of the van, the uh, distance between the bottom portion of the wall, you know, that I was basically cutting all the panels and cutting the plywood to, only really varied by about an eighth of an inch from start to back. So quite parallel, um, almost perfectly parallel. And so it made my kind of panel by panel approach really simple. You know, there's not that much to where I felt like it would have actually been any benefit to create, you know, those massive templates, um, which are super time consuming. And then instead spent that time on the, you know, the installation of the, the plywood subfloor itself. So guys, if you're still here, uh, I would super appreciate it if you'd give this video a like. If you enjoyed this video, you might appreciate this video right here where I did the first half of this install, which was that insulation and aluminum substructure. Or if you want to see, there's another video right here, which was the install of my flare space bed flares. And basically, would I do it ever again? I don't know. Maybe go check out that video. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments, guys. As always, I'll see you, though, in the next video.